So like I explained, uh, we just want some more insight for dietitians and nutritionists uh, just around the world uh, to see that you're going through similar uh, you know, things while uh, in quarantine. So uh, with the first question, just so people can get to know you, um, explain your job and your typical role in educating athletes. Sure. Uh, so my, uh, my job is the physical performance lead for British swimming. Um, it, it's kind of a split role. I have, you know, a part of my week, maybe about 40% of my role is managing the physical performance team, which consists of the nutritionist team, the nutrition team, the strength and conditioning team, and the physiology team. Uh, and then the other 60% or so of my role is direct nutrition support one-to-one -one with athletes. So I work with around 30-ish elite swimmers across British Swimming's world-class program um, and support's mainly just focused around making sure that they, I, I can help them understand uh, where and how their diet can be manipulated in order to maximize their, uh, their performance. Okay, awesome. And um, just a little bit more background of your background. Uh, what was your career path like? How, what have you done in your career that has led you to uh, where you are today? Sure. So I'm a, uh, I'm a nutritionist that comes from a sports science background. So I studied sports mm -hmm. science as an undergrad. I then went on to study a couple of different postgrads in uh, sport and exercise nutrition. Um, uh, following my, I suppose, my first stint of formal study, I took an internship with the English Institute of Sport, which supports a number of elite athletes and a number of world-class programs here in the UK, and then continued to work with them for a couple of years with the GB judo and boxing teams up to the Beijing 2008 Olympics. I then moved on to Scottish Rugby, where I was head of nutrition there for around about eight years before joining um, British Swimming just before Rio 2016, in, initially in a, in a full-time nutritionist capacity. And uh, as I say, I've since my job's progressed and, and split slightly between uh, nutrition delivery and uh, team management. Okay. That's pretty interesting. Um, and as I know we discussed a little bit earlier on in the call um, with quarantine and COVID-19, how it has essentially halted the sporting world. Um, how has COVID-19 changed your normal work routine? Because you're not in the office, you're not interacting you know, with your colleagues or athletes. Um, how has it changed um, your work routine? Yeah, um, obviously, obviously quite a lot, um, yeah. particularly for me, because I, uh, because I work across multiple different programs within the British Swimming mm -hmm. Network, I'm, I'm always traveling. So um, okay. I, 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 I live quite remote in comparison to a number of our key performance centers. Typically, we have three key performance centers. The closest one's only about 30, 40 miles away from me, which is great, but the other two are 300, 400 miles away. So typically my week is all spent traveling and away from home. So maybe I have three to four days a week working away and, and maybe only one or two days a week working from home. So I've got the working from home part bit, you know, sorted out and that, that was a pretty yeah. easy transition for me. But um, working from home one to two days a week versus five days a week is obviously uh, really quite really quite different so it's been uh, it's been a bit of a change just to uh, to make sure that I have the same level of uh, discipline and approach and can understand my workflow now that I'm permanently based at home or at least mm -hmm. not permanently but certainly for the foreseeable future yeah. for the past few weeks um, uh, but other than that it's not been it's not been too challenging we still maintain a lot of you know, connectivity uh, across athletes and uh, swimmers, oh, sorry, swimmers and staff and coaches across our program through, you know, very regular calls such as um, such as on Zoom and other video platforms, as well as just voice calls. Actually, we've we've ended up doing so much on video calls that people have forgotten just to pick up the phone and have a normal telephone conversation, yeah. which is uh, <laughs> which is almost quite pleasing to have nowadays. Sometimes, so mm -hmm. yeah, uh, a lot of a lot of connectivity, but it, but it certainly has changed the uh, the routine and the pattern. Okay. And that sort of leads me into another question that I was going to ask is what are the ways you are still communicating with, you know, your colleagues and, you know, the swimmers, how uh, you just mentioned voice calls, uh, Zoom meetings. Um, are there any other ways that you all are staying updated with each other? 
Yeah, well, we've, we've got a number of um, meetings booked in each week that are, are regularly recurring meetings. So, uh, you, you know, if we take one athlete group, for example, we'll have a weekly planning meeting at the front end of the week. At the back end of the week, we'll have yeah. a weekly review meeting. Um, I'll host various different departmental meetings and meetings with peers. And then we'll have various different project meetings that are going on a little bit more intermittently. So, yeah, actually, if you look at the diary before you've um, allotted any of your own activities, it, it's still fairly pretty busy with uh, with different pieces of work going on and, and the way that our program is set up with a lot of online coaching for uh, for the swimmers uh, and a lot of lead coaching sessions for the swimmers it's, it's meant there's still not that many hours in the day where there's not a great deal of activity going on you're either actively coaching or providing support or you're in meetings discussing that active coaching and the provision of that support so it's yeah. it's, it's been pretty busy and then directly with the athletes i use whatsapp a heck of a lot so a lot of uh, okay. uh, either a lot of visual aids that are sent on to them or if maybe i see a clip on social media that i think they'll like i'll send it to them via whatsapp uh, or leave them just little voice notes or little video notes and we we go back and forth communicate using whatsapp quite a lot okay it's awesome. And uh, I know you mentioned you you already sort of traveled a lot for work uh, before uh, COVID-19, but what are other main challenges you're facing other than like trying to, you know, get acquainted with working at home more? Um, are there any other challenges that you're facing every day um, just by working from home? Yeah, well, it's, um, I suppose, the, the, the practical workflow challenges that I'm experiencing. I've got a couple of young kids and they're, uh, they're off school at the moment. So I've got a, my, my wife's been brilliant at dealing with them as far as homeschooling is concerned. But occasionally I dip my hand in until I get too frustrated and have to, uh, have to revert back <laughs> to the office. Um, but, you know, as a swimming program, we, we, we were in, a, lockdown came at quite a challenging time for us. We were, uh, we were preparing for British Championships, which were in mid-April. And the British Championships um, uh, was also our Olympic selection event as well. So all of our guys were pretty much ready to race fast. And um, I don't know how much you know about swimming, but, but typically swimmers don't swim that fast a lot of the year. You know, they might only swim really fast twice a year. And for us, the twice a year comes in April and then again in summer at the major Olympic meet. So the guys were, were gearing up and getting ready to, uh, to put in some good times and be very competitive. And, uh, and then all of a sudden that got taken away from us. Uh, we learned fairly quickly the British Championships was cancelled, which is absolutely the right move. And in turn, the Olympic Games has then been postponed for, uh, for 12 months. So we went, um, it was a challenging situation as far as the swimmers are concerned, because immediately you had a lot of just resetting of goals and of expectations and a lot of that to manage, as well as just an uncertainty as to how long this period would be, uh, would be going on. So, yeah, there was a huge flurry of activity at the start of lockdown, particularly from our physical performance team and making sure that um, that the athletes had equipment that they understood uh, what they could be doing on land um, you know swimming is a sport that's dominated by volume and dominated by volume in the pool these guys swim you know between on, on average between 40 and 60 kilometers a week and some of the endurance guys will swim up to about 100 kilometers a week in the pool and when you remove the pool you just can't replace that volume um, you know these yeah. guys are they're great in the water they're not that great on land so it's not as if they can just replace that with running volume or with cycling volume so it's um it, it, it's become incredibly difficult for those guys to reinvest their energies in land training and uh, and, and away from uh, away from the pool Mm -hmm. That was a, actually, a, that's a very good insight that you just provided because I was going to ask, like, with swimmers, you know, with other sports, you can sort of find ways to work out that may not be exactly how um, you normally do, but with swimming, you're, you're not in the pool. You can't go to the facility. You can't, you can't do your normal, um, I guess, work, workout that you normally do or your normal practice session. So um, that was very good insight. And um, have you noticed any, you know, how have you and, you know, the, the staff sort of helped with nutrition um, and also just help with like the coaching aspect of these athletes aren't able to do their normal routine? Has that affected like the recommendations you provide them when they're at home? Yeah, most, most certainly has done. Um, you know, a, a typical swim week for our guys would uh, incorporate around about between nine and 10 uh, swim sessions a week. And then maybe between two and three gym sessions and a couple of 
sessions mainly focused around mobility so it might be yoga or pilates type sessions so a lot of that land work we can keep in but obviously like you say we can't get the uh, the access to the pool so we replaced some of that volume and, and and aerobic cardiovascular intensity with bike sessions some with running sessions but again you, you just can't replicate that same volume that you would do so um immediately you've got like you say you've got a restructure in the swimmers uh, day and um uh, you know, what's, one swimmer made actually a very insightful comment to me the other day. They said, in the absence of swimming, there was just nothing to look forward to in my day. So the thing that I looked forward to most was cooking and was food, which, okay. which is great as far as I'm concerned, because that's something I want to jump all on top of. And, and, and we, can, we can harness that enthusiasm and that energy for cooking and, uh, and, and, and food. But it, what it did mean is that people's mindset and attitudes shifted when it came to food. And I don't know if you've seen the same over in the US, but certainly here we've seen um, a huge increase in baking and, and, and people experimenting that little bit more in the kitchen, which is brilliant for me again. But it, it just yeah. just goes to show that the, the, the guys were thinking very differently about food. And as such, my recommendations uh, did have to change. So um, uh, with the total volume and training load decreasing in comparison to what they would, uh, they would normally do, uh, we, we naturally look for a slight decrease in, in energy intake. And on top of that, they're what we call the non-exercise activity thermogenesis. So that's the energy that they expend just through normal daily activities from walking, from moving and so on. All of that type of energy was, was decreasing because, you know, maybe some of our guys didn't go to university and they weren't walking around between lectures and so on and so forth, or they just weren't moving as much. They were, they were training and they were largely resting because there was no other facility for them to do much beyond that and much else. So uh, we got a big drop off in energy expenditure in comparison to what we'd normally see. So we needed to facilitate that with a decrease in energy intake. But we're, we're balancing a bit of a coin in that sense because the first, um, the first focus of my nutrition interactions with these guys when we went into lockdown was how do, we, um, how do we support your immune system as best as possible? Um, and, and for obvious reasons, to decrease um, infection risk and uh, if, if anybody was infected, then uh, maximize their, um, or minimize the amount of time that they're compromised by that and maximize their health throughout that process. But um, the one thing that you want to do for supporting an immune system is make sure it's got ample energy going in. So it was, it was a tight, tight line that we were trying to walk in decreasing energy intake to reflect the decreased training um, uh, and energy expenditure demands but also maintain enough energy in the system that the immune system was, was fully, fully functioning and as strong as possible. Okay. And uh, so I know uh, we sort of mentioned earlier how uh, nutritionists are sort of, you know, figuring out how to work around uh, the regulations, uh, quarantine, lockdown. Um, what are recommendations you have for other nutritionists and dietitians who are still trying to figure out that that perfect way to interact with you know their athletes and their coworkers? Sure. So um, the first thing I try and do is is, is try and better, try and understand as quickly as you can what what your athlete's environment is. Uh, and what the mm -hmm. risks are, what the opportunities are, what are the, the barriers and, and the enablers in order to, um, uh, or that are in place that, that hinder or help them being able to, um, uh, to eat in the way that they want to do. So with that sort of mindset, I, I got in touch with all of our priority swimmers and I said, to them, look, let's, let's just set up a quick call um, and we can do that in whatever format that you want. If you want to exchange just messages written or voice notes on WhatsApp, that's great. If you want a voice call, if you want a video call, whatever format suits you best, but let me just have that opportunity to engage with you and, um, and, and try and guide you where I think there, there needs to be some support around your diet. Uh, but also to give you the opportunity to ask a couple of questions and, and find out some things that maybe you just hadn't considered and hadn't thought about at that time. So that was something I did very early in lockdown and also then gave us a platform to reflect upon 
as we uh, as we as we progressed because the further we got into lockdown into weeks four five and six we started to see um, uh, people's attitudes towards nutrition maybe just slightly changing because there wasn't so much the the novelty that there was at the start of the process and motivation mm-hmm. started to shift as well so it's important to once you've established what that individual's environment is and you can provide some support around that continually get back into that and continually check in on that and see if things have changed and see if there's any other opportunities that um, that might have arisen um, and then the other big thing is you know, like that anecdote that I mentioned with the swimmers saying that um, their their sense of um, uh, their sense of enjoyment came from food and that being a shift is you kind of got to give a purpose to food and nutrition at this time um, it's an absence of there being externally motivated um, uh, performance motivation, let's say. So, uh, you know, the British Championships got removed from us. The Olympics got removed from us. Those were huge motivating factors in, uh, in our athletes' um, choices and decisions. As soon as those got removed, you can see naturally why there would be less attention to detail to the diet, for example. So you've got to try and look for ways where we can embrace and we can encourage uh, positive dietary choices. So if an athlete came to me and said, oh, yeah, I've been I've been baking for all my family this week, then I go, well, great. Now, it might not be exactly the type of things I want you to be eating all the time, but let's see how we can integrate this into your um, into your program. And, um, one of the other swimmers says to me that the biggest thing that they're missing throughout this time is actually going out to eat, going out to restaurants to, to eat. And that's nothing to do with the food that they would be exposing themselves to that they couldn't access at home. It's much just much more to do with that social connectivity, that psychosocial element that's involved in, in, in going out and socializing and, and being in a public place. And food becomes a huge part of that. So um, uh, her method of addressing that was uh, her and her family sat down every Saturday night and they did what we call a fake away. So they each chose a theme and one night it would be Mexican and somebody in the household would be responsible for cooking all the Mexican food. The, the next week it was an Indian, whatever it might well be. So uh, I think just great opportunities and ideas there to give food a real purpose in the absence of there being um, uh, kind of externally motivated performance-based goals. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good insight as well. Um, yeah, I know you mentioned uh, like how swimmers are, they're, paying more attention to food, they're baking, they're maybe trying new recipes. And um, I have noticed uh, with, you know, my friends and colleagues that, you know, we'll start doing new recipes and sending in a group text just to keep that communication open and keep, uh, you know, it's always nice to socialize. And it still has the social aspect of, you know, going out to eat with friends, but whereas we can't right now, you know, you just share like your newest recipe that you just did. Yeah. Um, has that social aspect still connected to it so yeah, yeah. like i i think that's absolutely huge and, and a lot of things a lot of the swimmers have said to me is i've um i've become a better i've become a better cook in the kitchen a better chef in the kitchen because i've had more time and i don't have to come home from training tired and think right i better get something in the oven quickly because i need to refuel i need to recover they've been mm-hmm. investing that little bit more time and therefore like you say they've been trying new recipes they've been opening old recipe books they've been searching online so we, we we did a bit of a push in just um, providing some very simple what we call food breakdown information so where you might go to the shop and pick up a jar of sauce for example maybe a pasta sauce we just broke that down to say look here's the five constituent ingredients whether it's onions some tomatoes some uh, some herbs and some spices and a bit of olive oil you can make this yourself so getting guys to to take the, the you know the very routine mundane foods that they would buy all the time or uh, products that they would buy all the time and then break that down into the um, into the simple constituents and then start cooking things from from basics and from scratch and I think that's really good opportunity throughout that time to um, to capitalize on this definitely and it also just practices um, self-care you know um, we're, we're at home and sometimes you as you know no matter who you are you could lose motivation you may not want to work out as much as you used to you may not want to eat healthy like you used to um but definitely i think uh trying new recipes uh making sure that you are uh, actually like cooking a good meal for yourself um but it, basically you put in the hard work of making a nice meal. you want to make sure that it's going to you know benefit you the most so you want to make sure you have all your nutrition uh, value there and um so definitely 
Yeah, there's some, and a, a few of our guys have been um, have moved away from their their normal training base or their normal location. Yeah. Maybe moved back in with parents as well, and actually they found themselves in a very different food environment very very quickly. So perhaps there's uh, there's a parent who's maybe taking on more of the cooking responsibility, and uh, and as they move back, they'll have to then readjust to their normal food environment. So the thing I've been saying to them is, look, you you've got to speak to mom and dad, and you've got to work out right. What you know, what are the recipes I can take away? with me now what is it that i've really enjoyed throughout this period uh, as well as chipping in and helping out and, and maybe taking your turn to cook so that those skills are maintained as best as possible because when they are back on their own or they're back with their normal flatmates uh, or partners then they are they're going to have to uh, it's, it's straight into the deep end they're going to have to fend for themselves again when they don't have that support network around them definitely and i know as you mentioned the olympics are postponed so once they get back to work it's literally getting back to work like um preparing for you know one of the biggest the biggest you know time of their career so that's uh, that's definitely true indeed and um so mentioning going back to work uh what challenges do you foresee yourself having um when you do end up being able to go back to work uh, on a somewhat normal routine? Yeah, um, for me, I, th I think there's, personally, there's gonna be a few challenges in that our return to work will still remain socially distanced measures for probably mm -hmm. a, a fairly considerable period of time. So uh, yeah. uh, how will my interaction look with coaches in a, uh, on, you know, on pool deck? How will my interactions look with, uh, with athletes on pool deck? I'm, I'm not just entirely sure how that's gonna be just now. So there, there might be an argument for actually until that point in which we, um, we have a bit more relaxed socially distanced measures that actually people who can operate remotely remain operating remotely for uh, for the time being so we'll wait and see on that uh, side of things certainly for the swimmers i think there's going to be some uh, just familiarization challenges maybe there's going to be some overcompensation uh, certainly in, in some of the people that have got a little bit more access to either private pools or uh, or open water to, to swim that a little bit more we've seen a little bit of uh, almost overcompensation within their diet so the the, the presence of swimming um, swimming's quite a good of, um, or has quite a strong um, uh, sort of appetite promoting factor to it particularly it seems to be in our guys. So actually naturally when they weren't swimming, their appetites dropped, but you reintroduce swimming and their appetites lifted back up again. So some of them have found themselves subsequently overeating to overcompensate for that, um, that increase in hunger. So there'll be some interesting um, uh, anecdotes and bits and, bits and stories and how we uh, try and go, uh, go about finding that, that fine line again between sufficiency and fueling and, uh, and, and avoiding any deficiency or any reduced energy availability then um certainly from uh, from a pool perspective we'll, we'll we'll give them a very gradual slow increase in training volume so we won't uh, we won't by any means go back straight into our normal you know 10 sessions oh, yeah. a week three four gym sessions it'll be nicely graded um they they certainly need time to uh time to swim and time to develop the, the capacity in the certain tissues that we just haven't been able to expose them to uh, over the past mm. uh, 10 or so weeks but yeah it, it, it for me it's going to look very different um a lot of our normal strategies such as uh, just athlete one-to-ones group workshops presentations um monitoring body composition all of that sort of stuff might well be um held back for a considerable period of time but um certainly it'd be nice to see their faces it'd be nice to see them um, active again and see all the other coaching staff definitely and just to sort of echo what you said about um how you really don't know how everything's going to go when you have a somewhat normal work schedule in the future. Um, and I think that's something I've heard from other nutritionists as well, that, you know, that's sort of the general consensus is that we don't really know and that everyone's mm. sort of figuring it out together. And I think that's an important message to send out to everyone who listens to this, that, you know, we're all in the same boat, that we're not, we don't have the answers. And it's okay if as a nutritionist, as a dietitian, as a coach or an athlete, you, it's okay not to have the answers because, you know, this is a once in a lifetime, hopefully once in a lifetime scenario that um, we just don't 
know how to navigate really so yeah you're absolutely right and, and we're in an ever-changing environment as well so uh you know, the, the situation we're, we're currently in is very similar to where we were right at the start of lockdown where we just didn't know how this was going to feel and how this was going to pan yeah. out um how people would respond to the programs that we're sending out online coaching all this type of stuff it was just novel to us um, and then we've, we, we reached a period of stability and we got some great outcomes and results from that. But now we're in a period where it's looking like we can get back in the water pretty soon. We've got government advice, which indicates the parameters around which we can uh, enter back into the water. And we're working through that to make sure that we can have our risk management um, strategies as tight as possible. And we can get back guys back in the water with some purpose. And, and, yeah. and with some, um, uh, you know, able to do something that becomes valuable to them, but um, at the same time without introducing them to risk unnecessarily. So it's, uh, it's, it's almost moving every, every couple of hours at the moment, the goalposts, as we learn that a little bit more and we get a little bit more feedback from uh, the partner organisations that we're involved in, as well as the swimmers and the coaches. So, yeah, it's, it, you're absolutely right. We, we don't know the answers. We won't know the answers. And uh, hopefully we won't need to know the answers for this to all be repeated again but it's still yeah. great learning nonetheless definitely um so uh on to my next question is just more focused on nutrition um how important would you say is nutrition i know that um most people would you know sort of know like i should be eating you know eating more of this and less you know fats and um fried foods or anything like that but how important is nutrition not just to athletes but to just all supplement users, um, would you say? Yeah, so look, uh, uh, nutrition is incredibly important, but um, yeah. but for me, food is far more important than nutrition. Um, all, mm -hmm. all nutritionists that you can speak to are going to be able to write that perfect diet. So just like you said, right? How do we balance the the exact number of calories or the approximate number of calories we need versus uh, meeting our macronutrient needs, our micronutrient needs, our hydration needs, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, we need our diets to be much more than about that. We need our diets to be much more than just fuel and numbers. We need our diets to, to nourish us, essentially. And, mm -hmm. Um, uh, yeah, so that so so that that should be the um, uh, that should be the point at which we start is that, that, that food is more than just food is more than just fuel. It means so much more to us. Just like we, we talked about on the uh, the social benefits of, uh, of of connecting with other people over food being incredibly important for one. But um, I suppose what then say for uh, within the supplement context. Um, uh, for me, we should supplement to correct a deficiency first and foremost. So if we <clears throat> identified that we can't correct that deficiency through a dietary method, then yes, supplementation can be, um, uh, can be considered. But we should have our diet set up in a way, wherever possible, that we don't need to rely on that uh, supplement uh, in order to achieve our, our nutrient needs. We might find ourselves mm. in special situations such as we do now with um, uh, an increase in training volume, maybe integrating um, um, slightly or slight easing of social distancing in some, uh, some aspects. So we, we, uh, we'll use supplements at the moment in order to mitigate some of those risks that we're being, um, I suppose, increasingly exposed to at the moment. But it, it shouldn't be, um, it should only be in there to correct deficiencies in the first instance. Uh, and then the other part of diet is the consistency is, is key. Uh, you know, our training is going to go up and down. Like we said before, our motivation for food and nutrition is going to go up and down, as will our mood. But, you know, food will always be consistent. It will be in there every day and therefore always presents to us an opportunity to, um, you know, we eat multiple times a day. Therefore, there's multiple opportunities to favorably affect our goals, favorably nourish yeah. us, favorably affect our mood as well. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's incredibly important nutrition, but um, food is more important, let's say. Mm -hmm. And uh, sort of to go off what you just said, um, nutrition and eating a well-balanced diet isn't just about fueling you know, yourself, uh, your body to meet your specific goals, but it's also uh, good for your uh, emotional impact your mood um how you feel uh, just in general uh nutrition and food have a really big uh role in that so if you eat really bad you'll notice you'll feel you know not as great as you would if you ate a more well-balanced healthy diet so just to sort of go off what you had just said uh, food nutrition plays a big role in not just physical but also mental um and i think that's something to focus on especially during um 
these strange times we're in that, you know, you don't just worry about your physical health, also worry about your mental health and um, yeah. food, making sure eating healthy will play a big, big role in that. Yep. I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. That's, um, that, yeah. that's absolutely the mindset and the approach that we like to take. Mm -hmm. um, so to sort of help uh, some uh, people at home, uh, what are apps that maybe you use or that your swimmers use or that you know are um, good apps for people to use to sort of stay focused on their nutrition, um, stay focused on their diets, um, and to help reach their ultimate physical goals? Yeah, well, we don't uh, we don't use a huge number of nutrition specific apps. Um, we occasionally mm -hmm. use some apps like um, MyFitnessPal to help uh, diet track, and uh, you know we kind of use a bit of a uh, a little bit of a linked buddy type system where I'll I'll be able to view the athlete's diets remotely and then be able to provide them a little bit of coaching, a bit of feedback on on what we think's good, bads, and different, and where they can um, make a bit of progress, make a couple of changes. Um, but otherwise, our, our our guys have access to a bespoke app that monitors their um uh, their their daily wellness as well as tracks their training load as well so i can check in on that on a regular basis and just uh, see where they're see where they're at and they can pop little bits and pieces of nutrition notes up on there as well otherwise we just stay in contact using um sort of social media connectivity apps whether it's uh, whatsapp like we mentioned and then also i'll also look uh take you to look through apps like instagram and, and youtube and, and see if there's anything there that I think the, the guys would like or the guys would respond to and then I'll just uh, uh, share that with them as uh, as appropriate really so we're not yet huge on uh, the use of apps we're probably just that little bit bigger on trying to maintain a level of one-to-one -one connectivity instead of um, um, instead of tracking in, in, in any other ways uh, the tracking through apps is is always challenging is always that little bit problematic um, it, it requires quite a skilled user to be able to get the most out of the app so we we were Try to use um, we'll try to use them um, if there was not so much if there's no other method available, but certainly at the moment is probably the best method available in being able to uh, to get some accurate information alongside uh, you know a telephone call and a bit of an interview on, on a food diary recall to make sure that everything is there. Okay, definitely. And I know uh, you mentioned earlier that supplement use uh, food food is first and foremost. Make sure that your diet is um, where it should be, make sure you're eating the appropriate things to help fuel your performance and your goals. Um, whereas a lot of people still do sup use supplements to supplement, uh, it's in the name, supplement their diet to sort of help those goals. Why would you say is it important for supplements to be tested by a third party I'll to make that. sure, that, um, you know, to just to make sure that there's, you know, tested for banned substances to protect the athlete? Sure. I mean, that, that's still hugely important, massive. Um, you know, like we say, our motivations and our reasons to use supplements during lockdown might well have changed, but our standards haven't. You know, our standards yeah. absolutely stay uh, the same and our approach to supplement use remains absolutely the same. So we've worked very closely with our nutrition partners, in particular HealthSpan Elite, who um, are health and informed sport listed uh, brand here in the UK. Um, and they've all helped us out massively to ensure that uh, what we need is able to get to our to our athletes amongst the time where uh, stock um, stock availability is, is really challenged because everybody's in this in the same sort of boat particularly uh, stocks of products that are associated with immune function and immune health so healthspan have been great to work with us um, throughout this period to make sure that we've got our, our supplement needs covered off um, you know it, it it goes without saying that regardless of whether we're in lockdown or whether we're in full training um, our athletes are remain responsible for what's in their body at any given time um, you know, regardless of what it is they're doing or where it is that they're doing that. So we remain throughout this period accountable to UK Anti-Doping and to the World Anti-Doping Agency, and we abide by those codes at all times. So it's, it's still incredibly mm -hmm. important for us that we've got uh, LGC and Informed Sport on our side when it comes to our product um, uh, selection. Definitely. Um, so, yeah, that I... I definitely want to echo that uh, as well, that um, even during quarantine, um, it is important to make sure that what you're putting in your body is going to be uh, good for you. And then it's also not going to um, result in any sort of deficiencies in terms of 
when you're tested. Um, just because you're not training doesn't mean you can sort of just do and, and take whatever, you know, without making sure it's been checked. So. Yep, absolutely. Our, our guys are 100% full-time athletes and that yeah. full-time exists whether we're in quarantine or not, whether their their uh, their training has changed or not. So we, we take the same uh, approach and we remain the same high standards when it comes to supplement selection. Yeah, definitely. And uh, do you have any other, uh, you know, uh, recommendations or anything else you would like to say to nutritionists who are experiencing the same thing you are right now? Um, sure. I, would, I, I, you know, I think like we said, we, we hit it on the head and we said, look, just, just be patient because we don't necessarily know all the answers. Um, yeah. uh, you, you know, we, you, you could spend a lot of time worrying about whether or not your athlete is going to be, um, uh, you know, a, a, a negatively affected by this, this lockdown period, whether that be through uh, training status or whether it be through body composition or whether it be through um, just meal choices and so on. But, um, uh, you know, just, just get in touch and just reach out and, and, and work with them and try and understand what their world is, you know, try and understand what those, say those enablers and those barriers are to them achieving their goals, taking, you know, touching on some behavior change research and looking at capability, opportunity and motivation is incredibly important throughout this time. So um, understanding them and then being able to, um, uh, to help and support them and, and realize what's, um, uh, what's a priority just now and what's not. So, you know, just like mm -hmm. we said, when we talked about mental health, we've got to respect that even though these guys are athletes and they are full-time athletes, they need a bit of space and they need a bit of time sometimes as well. And, and sometimes that's got to come with a break from what they perceive as being um, the, the routine and the, the requirements of their diet. And, and yeah. we, we've got to afford them a bit of space to, uh, to relax sometimes. So having a knowledge and understanding of that and then being able to say to them, look, it, it's fine. And, and perhaps it's in the case of, well, if we increase a couple of kilos throughout this period, don't worry because we've got ample time before we need to um, we need to be back on our optimal training weight or our optimal racing weight or our optimal composition for performance and we can work towards that so uh, slight setbacks just now aren't going to affect things in the long run if we can uh, be aware of them and plan for them effectively definitely that's that's awesome advice um to for uh, i think for everyone to follow uh, during all of this um, that's all the questions I had for you. Uh, I want to thank you so much, Rich, for taking your time out of your day. Um, I know it's the end of your day where you are, and I'm sure you're ready to be off work and enjoy uh, enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thanks very much for uh, for having me. It's a pleasure to chat, and uh, happy to do it any other time. Awesome. Thank you so much. Cool.